Good morning and welcome to the Academic Foundation Programme Conference 2020. It's my pleasure to be chairing this morning's meeting. My name is Jill Banks and I am the director of the AFP programme in Northern Deanery. I'm also a clinical paediatric allergist at the Great North Children's Hospital here in Newcastle and professor of medical education at Newcastle University. Now I know that our audience will be both current Foundation Programme trainees and students who are interested or intending to apply to the FP programme. And in this conference, our goal was to reflect the common and important questions you all might have about navigating career pathways and how to get the most from them. We have a great lineup of speakers, trainees at different career stages, who will share their experiences, perspectives and career journeys, along with faculty colleagues who manage these programmes and so have all the up-to-date information on process and practicalities. Firstly, Professor Paul Baker is Deputy Dean in the North West and is Academic Lead in the UK FPO Foundation School Directors Committee. He will give an overview of the Academic Foundation Programme and consider the all important process questions on how do I apply. Next, Dr. Alex Martin is a clinical teaching fellow at Newcastle University and he's just completed his AFP here. Alex will consider the questions, what does an AFP actually do? He'll share his experience, highs, possibly lows, and also how to make the most of the AFP placement as well as keep on top of clinical progression. Dr. Matt Byrne has also completed his AFP recently and has taken up an academic clinical fellow post in Oxford Deanery. Matt will talk about his experience and how it may have influenced his decision making. This will get you thinking about why you might consider AFP. Lastly, we wanted to think about the Academic Foundation Programme in the context of wider academic career pathways. And I'm delighted that we have two speakers to present on next steps and what are the academic career pathways beyond AFP. Dr. Will Sedley is an academic clinical lecturer in neurology who was previously an AFP trainee. He will talk about his own career journey and what has made that so successful. Dr. Malcolm Broadley is an MRC clinician scientist and a clinical senior lecturer whose work focuses on pediatric respiratory medicine. He is also the director of the Northeast NIHR Integrated Academic Training Program for Doctors and Dentists. Malcolm will be able to explain where AFP fits into clinical academic training pathways and what you need to do to pursue an academic career please do take an opportunity to ask the speakers questions. You will have seen the Slack chat channel and please do use this. So finally, that just leaves me to thank colleagues at FDOCS for this opportunity, the fantastic speakers and you, the audience for attending, especially on a weekend. I look forward to a lively discussion throughout the morning. So first up, we are lucky to have um, our first speaker who is uh, Paul Baker, Deputy Postgraduate Dean for Health Education England. Welcome Professor Baker, please take it away. My name is Paul Baker, I'm a Deputy Postgraduate Dean at Health Education England, uh, working across the northwest of England. I also have a role in academic foundation programmes nationally, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today. Thank you for your attention. So, um, first slide. Uh, I'm going to split this talk into two sections. Uh, firstly, I'll say a little bit about what academic foundation programs actually are, uh, some background. And secondly, I'll tell you something about how to apply. What I will say repeatedly is that uh, Academic Foundation uh, and all its processes are subject to change. Uh, that happens year on year in any case, things evolve, things improve. 
Um, even without COVID, things can change and timelines can alter. So the uh, uh, overarching rule here is to always check with the Foundation Programme website. Okay, that's the website uh, that you should always use. There are two other sources of information which I want to point you towards. One is the Rough Guide to Foundation uh, Academic Training, also to be found on that website. It gives you lots of background information and opinions from uh, previous trainees and, and other sources, very valuable information. And throughout this, I'll be reminding you that there are variations between foundation schools across the UK. That's not just across England, but across the whole of the United Kingdom. And you must check with the individual school for uh, individual information at every point. Now, the main value of this uh, uh, conference uh, here today is that you've got a very good panel to interact with. And I've highlighted three questions which often uh, are raised with myself. I want you to consider these. And if you have a spare moment during the slideshow, uh, please type your thoughts into the chat box. Uh, who is this? How is he relevant? Well, you may remember this, this guy from uh, a Bond movie, um, Tomorrow Never Dies. And his, his overriding advice was, uh, was about careers, good, conveniently enough. And he said that his first boss uh, taught him uh, that the secret to a good story is not the, the what, the where, the who or the how, but it's the why. So I'm asking you, you're tuning in today, why are you interested in academic foundation careers? I want you to uh, write your thoughts as to what really is motivating you, because that's the key to, to the whole process. I'm oft, also often asked, is academic foundation the only route into academia? So give me your thoughts on that. And another consideration is, uh, if doing academic foundation, do you have to do all the same things that other uh, non-academic foundation trainees have to do? Uh, give me your thoughts on those whilst I'm speaking. So what is academic foundation training? Um, it is approximately 1 20th of the whole program. Uh, and there are about um, 7,500 uh, foundation places uh, nationally. And over 500 of those are academic foundation. Uh, so as I say, in any one school, there should be at least one in 20. And we generally uh, exceed that target in the UK. Again, I will repeat, many aspects of academic foundation are school specific. So please do your local research uh, before uh, deciding. And academic uh, foundation allows you to um, delve into the worlds of research, education, that includes education research, leadership, and there is scope for other special experience type of posts, such as quality improvement. Uh, that is not an ex exhaustive list. So the programme allows you to develop interests and also get the support, uh, the contacts, uh, the networking, the information you'll need during and in addition to your first two year uh, clinical training. So flexibility is uh, built into the academic foundation program and has been right from the beginning. What must an academic foundation program deliver? Well, it has to deliver the normal foundation competencies. So the same competencies anybody else uh, has to get in foundation training uh, have to be delivered during found uh, academic foundation training as well. Now, AFP, as we call it, can be one of an organized step in the integrated academic training pathway, by which I mean, you could be an academically minded student, you do an academic foundation training post, and then you uh, naturally succeed into a um, academic clinical lecturer post and, and the academic pathway there on after. It does fulfill that role. However, it can also fulfill the role of uh, those just wanting to dip a toe into an academic career. So you may not be totally decided, you may want to see what academic 
work is like and academic foundation can um, fulfill that as well uh, if you are very very advanced as a medical student into the academic sphere for instance we do see applicants with uh, phds or other uh, higher degrees maybe you don't need academic foundation so don't don't think that's automatic but once again this is very site specific and school specific so please do your homework um, look for different models of academic foundation uh, because there is variability uh, usually it's a four month block taken in fy2 but there are other models such as a half a day throughout the two-year course again do your local research um, look for the right location for you and geography is is uh, often the overriding concern for many trainees look at what track models they have there as i've just described in particular look for the amount of dedicated time you get from uh, ordinary work related to academia and this can vary from none, uh, uh, no no added time at all simply doing work in your spare time to as i've just said four months off or two months um, uh, sorry four months in the uh, uh, FY two year or half a day throughout the two years. So look at the time that's been allocated. Uh, look for what input there is from your local medical school or a higher education institute. You may, for instance, get a, an honorary contract with them. That may give you other added values such as access to high T, access to networks. So a lot of this is about networking and contacts for future progression. Uh, look to see if your interests can be uh, maintained in that post and look at the track record of that, uh, that, that placement, whether it be for presentations, publications, uh, allowing you to present at conferences and so on. You may also wish to uh, look at, at further postgraduate qualifications, whether you want to be uh, a teacher, what specialty uh, you wish to go in is important and look at the specialty societies uh, and again what access there is to to their specialty conferences publications and so on uh, there are two things to to consider as well as being an academic but also being a medical specialist um, it should be part of an overall career plan uh, and do think about where you want to be next where you want to be in five or ten years or longer and work backwards from that and we've already spoken about specialty or gp training uh, there is an integrated academic training pathway but i would warn you that this is uh, specific to the four countries in the united kingdom so although england is 85 percent of, of the population and you've heard of nihr uh, the academic uh, institution that is England only, uh, only and if you if you are in Northern Ireland Wales or Scotland there are separate systems for that and the reference I will give you for that is once again the rough guide to academic foundation training to be found on the UK FPO foundation website so the second section of the presentation is about applying for academic foundation in the united kingdom and again the health warning is there that things are subject to change they're subject to change even more in a, an era of covid and uh, you must always check with three sources of information uh, before making final decisions uh, the main source is the uk fpo website that's the uk foundation program office website is there on the slide um, there's a rough guide to academic foundation which is to be found on that website which has a lot of useful information and uh, be sure to look at the information for each specific school because we uh, we know that it can vary once again the main value of this conference conference is that you can interact with the panel so once again, I'm asking you to put in three questions about the application to AFP into the chat box 
and I'll address those whilst uh, we're talking. There will be uh, opportunity for further questions at the end. So why is this guy relevant? He's not a Bond villain. Uh, some of you may know that it's uh, Steve Jobs and uh, he was the founder of uh, the Apple uh, phenomenon that we all know. And um, he can be a divisive figure to some, but uh, he certainly achieved uh, a lot of things. And what did he say? He said, I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, he, he gave a very, uh, by now famous uh, valedictory speech at, uh, at uh, an American educational institution. And to paraphrase, he said, find the job you love and do that. Those weren't his exact words. I think there's another saying such uh, that, that, that goes something like, if you find a job you love, you'll never work a day in your life. So this is all about career choices and making uh, something that uh, you're interested in uh, really count for that. Three questions then. If I do academic foundation, will I get less clinical experience? Commonly asked. Uh, is there a master's qualification? What, what, what is the scope for that? And what are units of application? That's a vital piece of understanding if you're going to apply for academic foundation. So um, the appointment system is known as Oriel. That's the IT platform for the uh, foundation applications. Uh, all the information is on the website and to uh, be looking for AFP placements. Firstly, sounds obvious, you must have the correct provisional GMC re registration, uh, as does any, any newly qualified doctor in the UK, and apply for the foundation program first, and, and then you consider the foundation option. So register on Oriel. Uh, there are what we call two units of application, and you'll need to know which ones you're applying to. Um, you can apply to only two, and for all the programs in those two units of application, those geographical groupings, uh, you may be asked to rank all the programs uh, in AFP that are available. Uh, so be prepared to do that and, and to stop your ranking at a point where you're no longer maybe interested in those, uh, in those placements. And we, we can discuss that later. Again, very school specific. There are almost as many variations of the appl application process as there are schools but you will all have to go through the first two steps that I've just mentioned there. That is get registered, apply for UK academic foundation training. Uh, this is the timeline and it's correct at the time of speaking. Hopefully it won't have to change because of any uh, pandemic or other uh, considerations, but uh, that is the timeline. So very soon, uh, Oriel will open, uh, the dates are there. And there is a window uh, during which you can apply. And um, the um, academic recruitment can be in stages, again, depending on, on the school and how, how large the school is, how sought after the school is. There will be different competition ratios. And you will all have to go through some sort of uh, long or short listing uh, and interview. So uh, that's the preference for nearly all academic schools uh, they are likely to uh, want a, an interview, which uh, in 2021 will be more than likely online. Again, do your homework, do your local research. Uh, you will all have to do the situational judgment test, which is the uh, route into foundation training in the UK. Again, it's a digital platform run by an organization called Pearson View. Uh, you are able to book a slot in a uh, date, a time and locations throughout uh, the UK. Um, that will be on a first come first served basis. So please don't leave everything till last minute or you may not be able to get the slot you want. And applications generally, please don't leave, uh, leave till the last minute. Uh, on the last day of applications at noon, uh, that's the time the applications close. We're very often looking in the last hour to see people still uh, not finishing their applications. And that, that's very risky. IT can fail, things can go wrong. So please don't leave it till the last minute. Uh, 
I'm often asked, can you withdraw from applications? Well, you can, but withdrawing before an offer is very much more easy than withdrawing after an offer. So please look at the website, look at the guidance for Academic Foundation and um, make sure you're aware of the rules before, before doing that. By and large, the rule is if you apply before an offer has been accepted, uh, you will go forward to the normal, uh, the normal foundation application process. Afterwards is uh, much, much more difficult and we don't suggest that you do that. So again, please check the website. And offers will be, we start to uh, be given in uh, the middle of January and it should all be done and dusted by, by the 11th of February. So that's the end of the uh, brief uh, section on uh, applying for the Academic Foundation Program. I've left it fairly light on technical details because uh, there are lots of variations locally and uh, lots of technicalities which you may be asking about of the, uh, the national part of the process. It's impossible for, you, for me to know every single uh, if then else type of question you may ask. So if you ask some very technical questions, I may simply refer you uh, back to UKFBO, but uh, we have time for questions now and uh, that will include uh, technical questions of the application process uh, where I can give you the answers. Thank you so much, Paul. I know that will be invaluable to many of our attendees. Our next speaker is a former AFP trainee, Dr. Alex Martin. Alex is going to talk us through a day in the life of an AFP. Over to you, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex, a former Academic Foundation Programme trainee in the Northern Deanery and now a Clinical Teaching Fellow at Newcastle University. I'm going to be talking about a day in the life of an Academic Foundation trainee. I'm going to be talking about my experience as an AFP and go through a typical week during my academic post. The original title of the talk was A Day in the Life, but actually I think a better title would be A Week in the Life, because one of the key takeaways for me was the variety of what I got up to, and one day just wouldn't do it justice. So I'm going to talk about A Week in the Life instead. I'll also talk about the benefits and challenges of AFP and how to make the most out of the post. So my foundation posts look like this. I started out with academic medicine with medicine on calls, and I'll talk a little bit more about the experience of starting on an academic job. I then went on to a busy job in gastroenterology and then acute medicine, then an even busier job in hepatobiliary surgery. My F2 year started with paediatrics, which was split into general and specialty paediatrics, and then I was due to have more surgery, but I found a swap to medicine, which is something that your deanery of choice may or may not permit. In Northern Deanery, we've got two academic blocks, and I was supposed to do academic medicine in my last post, but due to coronavirus, I was redeployed. So I stayed on in acute medicine and did a total of six months there. So my F1 academic post was characterized by a lot of variety. Uh, so firstly, I was involved in a large multinational study called PERFORM, uh, which was looking at personalized biomarkers for sepsis. I also explored my own research question, looking at clinical features of bacterial infection in immunocompromised children. And that was done at the Great North Children's Hospital. That used data from the larger study, but it was my own study which I had control of. I also had a chance to try new things. So I learned to use high level PPE. And for someone who is more comfortable with clinical research, I even did some lab work. I also got involved in some patient public involvement for our study which is something that's increasingly expected in grant applications and was a really useful experience that I've taken into my own work. So what did a week look like for me during the uh, F1 academic post? Well, on Monday, I might have been working on the PERFORM study, consenting and recruiting patients, uh, collecting blood samples, centrifuging them, freezing them for later analysis. One of the things that I hadn't really appreciated with when was when you're working on a really large study, just how many samples you end up with and managing those, tracking them, not losing them, was a really big task in doing this study. Um, after that, I might have worked on some electronic case report forms that collect patient data and addressed any queries from the data management team. The next day, I might have worked on my audit and prepared some medical student teaching. I also spent time working on my own independent research question, which used data from PERFORM. 
We also had study team meetings, uh, more recruitment. I would go to F1 teaching during uh, lunchtime. And then maybe I'd have some lab work for the study and I'd deliver that teaching that I prepared earlier in the week. One in four weekends, I would have the Friday off and then work long days back of house in adult medicine. Uh, and one in four weeks, I would also work the evenings Monday to Thursday in medicine. Uh, so these on calls kept me up to date with my clinical skills, but they also kept my hours up. So uh, I was working 48 hours, which was on par with the rest of my colleagues. And uh, so I was actually bringing in uh, the same amount of money uh, as a lot of them were. So due to COVID, I was redeployed from my academic post and I carried on in acute medicine. And this was actually quite nice because many of the other jobs that I've been working in have been quite short. And for the first time, I really felt part of the team, especially COVID brought together the acute medicine team and the consultants were really thankful for us being there. Uh, however, during even during re redeployment, uh, there were opportunities to get involved in other things that, and that was all made easier by the skills that you develop as an AFP. Because I'd uh, I had experience in clinical research studies and good clinical practice training and advanced life support, I was able to be released from clinical work to work as a co-investigator on the Chaddox NIHR COVID vaccine trial. Um, so I recruited and consented patients and got them ready to have the new investigational vaccination for COVID. I also got involved in the running of simulation teaching for our new incoming F1s. Uh, also, your F2 post is generally when things you've worked on start to come together. And between my F1 and F2 posts, I managed to have a post to present at an international meeting. I got some education work presented locally, completed two cycles of an audit, uh, published a case report, and there's two more research manuscripts in progress from all of that as well. So even missing one of the academic jobs, I was still able to get a lot of good outputs from my CV. The AFP does come with some challenges, and those are really important to recognize and reflect before you apply and during your post. I had my academic job first, which was a little daunting as I've got no, had no experience doing a ward job, but had on calls, weekends and evenings, and arguably during those you've got a bit less support. Uh, somebody with limited experience, even doing basic procedures like cannulation and less confidence overall, you're kind of getting thrown in the deep end a little bit doing that. Academic work can also be a little bit different to clinical work. So when I was doing my hepatobiliary surgery job as an F1, I was personally looking after about 25 quite sick patients across several wards with quite limited support and would often get maybe 50 calls a day chasing up tasks, sometimes multiple calls about the same thing. Uh, and I was often juggling several things at once. So while that was challenging in its own way, uh, equally on my academic post, I was often left to decide what I should be doing for long periods uh, and it can be quite hard to know what to do next and some people might find it difficult to motivate themselves in those circumstances. AFPs generally have less clinical time than everyone else as well. Depending on the region, you might have four or even eight fewer months in full-time clinical practice, um, which is the case in Northern Deanery. And so you'll need to work that bit harder to feel as confident as the rest of your peers. There's also fewer opportunities to engage with your portfolio during your academic post. And so overall, you need to complete your portfolio in less time. This really creeps up quickly because you have to submit your completed portfolio early on in the last job of the year, meaning that you have to work hard in your clinical posts to keep up. My second post was a busy general and acute medicine post, which did get me back up to speed clinically quite quickly. However, a lot of the data that I needed to work on my own research question wasn't ready until after I'd finished that first academic post. This meant that to progress my work, I had to do some work during another post, which fell during the medicine post. But it can be difficult to find time to do this. So this is an example of my acute medicine rotor. So it was all 12 and a half hour shifts, 50% nights and one and two weekends. So you were equally spending time between doing nights, recovering from nights, doing long days, or you had a small amount of time off. For anyone who's done research alongside being a student, it's not quite the same doing it alongside a full-time job. You're learning a lot of new things. Uh, the job can at times be stressful. 
the hours are long, you're working 48 hours a week. Uh, so when you come home, you don't necessarily want the work on research. So you really need to be careful to look after yourself. Your NFP might give you a really exciting opportunity to do independent research, contribute to larger projects, and also get opportunities to teach, get involved in quality improvement, and just develop yourself generally outside of clinical work. And you should absolutely pick things that interest you and try them. But part of making the most out of the post is, and that is both the academic component of the post and the clinical component, is that you will be plenty busy on your clinical jobs and you need to look after yourself and take the time to explore what it's like working in a different way, working in the way that academics do. You need to think about when to say no to things. Often the type of people who do AFP say a lot, yes to lots of different opportunities, but you can't say yes to everything and still do a good job of everything. This can be a bit of a balancing act between what you promise and what you deliver and it's important to manage expectations. I think it's a really important part of your self-growth as an academic clinician to recognise what you're able to achieve, how much time you have, and what you're able to deliver. Amongst all of the opportunities that you've got available to you, remember that you are a doctor first above everything else. You need to keep on top of your clinical and portfolio commitments, and this will reduce your stress in the long run. Don't worry too much about your clinical competence overall, Part of the selection for AFP is for people who the selectors think will be able to juggle these different commitments and you will be as competent as your peers after a couple of jobs. Remember your portfolio and start working on it quite early. It's absolutely essential to make sure that you take the portfolio seriously and work on it from the beginning. Um, try and find any opportunities that come up to try and work towards it uh, and that will help you avoid stress at the end of the year. So what are my takeaways from all this? So AFP is great. I can't speak for other deaneries, but my AFP program in Northern Deanery and with my supervisor, there was the flexibility to get involved in lots of things within and also not directly linked to your research. It allows you to pursue something that interests you and to develop new skills. Academic work is quite different to working on the ward. Uh, that can be a relief, but it can also be quite challenging in its own way. Remember that despite all the opportunities that will be available to you, you need to manage expectations and know when to say no to things. Respect your portfolio as well because uh, it can cause you a lot of stress if you don't. Above all everything else, you're a doctor first and the priority for your foundation program is to develop the skills you'll use as a doctor for the rest of your career. Finally, I'd say that if my experience sounds good to you, the level of variety and the chance to explore something that really interests you in much more detail, then I'd say go for it and I'm pretty sure you're going to really enjoy it. Thank you Alex. Next I'd like to hand things over to Dr Matt Byrne. Matt is a current ACF in Oxford and a former AFP in Cambridge. Matt will give his perspective on whether or not you should consider AFP in the first place. Over to you, Matt. Hi, thanks for having me here. Prof Vance has asked me to speak about my experience of the AFP, so I know why I'm here. Um, but I'd want to start off with a quick question to you. Why are you here? Um, I think the simple answer is to learn more about the AFP. So I want you to think deeper. Why are you here when you could be doing something else on your weekends? Take 30 seconds to think about that question. Write it down in the chat if you want, um, or if you don't want to share, then on a piece of paper will be fine, and we'll revisit it later. Um, so while you're thinking about that, I'll let you know a little bit about me. Um, so I did my medical training in Newcastle. I had my first exposure to academia when I was um, when I did an audit in fourth year, and I liked the feeling as though I was making a difference rather than just following the rules or rote learning things. I then did an MRes in transplantation as I liked immunology and surgery. And I put all my eggs into one basket and went hard on transplant. I did an AFP in Cambridge in transplantation and thought perhaps it wasn't for me. Um, so I took a year out to make up my mind. And when I did that, I also did a PG cert. I ended up doing an ACF in urology as I decided I want to sleep when I was a consultant. Um, so back to our question, why are you here? 
Um, you might already be interested in research. You might be on the fence. Perhaps you've done a little bit of research and you want to hear more. And maybe it'd be something nice for your CV. And I think broadly speaking, these are the main reasons that people apply to the ACF or AFP. Um, so what's my role going to be here today? Um, I'm going to talk to you about why you should consider the AFP, um, how you could get the most out of your AFP, career progression afterwards. And if you have any questions as we go along, please drop them in the chat. Um, so first things first, um, we'll look at why you should consider the AFP. Uh, we'll discuss what the point of an AFP is, what it offers you, um, alternatives to normal applications um, and academic projects. So first of all, what's the point of an AFP? Um, it's an introduction to the integrated academic pathway. Um, the aim from a purely institutional point of view is to generate clinicians who are trained in research um, and have time to perform research. But what does it offer you? The main benefits are exposure to research, dedicated academic time, either day release, a four month block or variations around that. And this allows you to develop your research skills and also transferable skills. Gives you an opportunity to network with a team you might not have exposure to normally. Um, and a small number of deaneries offer extra things like academic teaching courses um, and training, uh, PG certs and research bursaries. And all of these things make it easier to progress along that academic training pathway. Um, it's also an alternative to the normal job application, um, as well as those reasons um, I discussed before. Uh, when I was at med school, I was good at taking exams, but I excelled in extracurriculars and interviews. The AFP gave me an opportunity to get a job by playing to my strengths rather than worrying about doing well in the SJT. AFPs also tend to be linked to teaching hospitals, so it's an alternative route to get the plum jobs too. For example, I knew I wanted to do surgery and out of my six foundation rotations, three were surgical and one was research. It also gives you two bites of the cherry at competitive job applications such as London. Admittedly, the AFPs do have a, um, a five to one competition ratio on average, so it'll be more competitive in those locations too. But the main attraction of the AFP is the academic project. Some are themed AFPs, um, and they might have specific speciality themes, or they might go beyond medical research, for example, leadership and med ed. Overall, there's a large amount of autonomy. Some AFPs are very flexible, but admittedly, some are quite inflexible too. And this might help inform where you want to apply. Um, I did my AFP in Cambridge. And I had ultimate flexibility. I could choose exactly what I wanted to do. And I didn't have to be, and it didn't have to be related to the transplant theme at all. I know some people who did ophthalmology research on my transplant themed AFP. Um, but some to that, some, for some people that might be a downside as there was zero structure and we had to organise everything. I think the London AFPs might be slightly less flexible, but I might be wrong. Um, and even if you don't get your AFP, it's still good interview practice um, for your core training interviews. So how to get the most out of your AFP. Um, in this section, we'll talk about setting a goal finding a supervisor in a project, thinking beyond the project, outputs, how you can use role models to help inform what you want to do, um, the role of networking, taste of weeks, extracurricular activities, and then some of the negatives about doing an AFP. So first of all, um, how to make the most of it. Um, if we go back to your reason for why you're here today, you can probably use that to set yourself a broad goal for your AFP. So for example, if you're already interested in research, you can use your project to go in something in more depth. If you've not done that much research before and you're not sure about it, you can use it as a time to figure out whether you like it or not. And you can use it as a chance to do things um, that will prepare you for core training as well. So the first step is to set yourself a goal. I think the primary aim should be to figure out whether you actually like research or not. And if you do, what sort of research do you like? Um, you can use it as a time to help you figure out what specialty you want to do. And you can then use this to help you start thinking about your life plan. I wouldn't focus too much on outputs um, during this time, but we'll discuss that in more detail later. Um, so the first step 
um, is to find a supervisor. And my tips for this would be to plan early. So really, you should be thinking about this before you even apply for your AFP. For example, I knew I wanted to, um, to uh, work with Professor Nicholson um, at Cambridge, who is an expert in ex vivo organ perfusion. So I sent him a message um, before I'd applied for the AFP um, to see what sort of projects I could be involved in. Um, and I spoke to other, other people there too to figure out whether it would be a good option. So start, once you're in your AFP, um, you should then seriously start organising it, um, organising your F2 research block when you're in F1. Because particularly if you're organising things like ethics or patient recruitment, it can take longer than four months. So you might end up spending your entire research block organising things without actually doing any research. My next tip would be to talk to multiple supervisors. Explore things you can do, what your role in their team would be, um, and also look at their publishing record. Um, are they publishing? Who are they working with? And speak to their students too. What do they think of the team and is it a nice environment to work in? Once you've heard from the supervisors, you'll get a broad idea of what sort of projects you can do. Um, alternatively, if you know what project you want to do, you can do it the other way around by focusing more on the project and then trying to align that with the potential supervisors. Um, and depending on the flexibility of your AFP, um, you can do pretty much any project, but people tend to do preclinical work, such as lab projects, um, but also some data science. You might also do clinical work, um, so patient recruitment, um, clinical database analysis, um, involved in audit, but sort of um, more commonly, there are also these leadership and management AFPs and also education AFPs. So there's, there's scope to do anything really. Um, so how do you figure out what sort of project to choose? This can sometimes be quite difficult. And what you can do to help yourself is to think about what you enjoy and what you dislike. And um, that's obviously obvious, but think about why. Try and be as specific as possible. Um, patterns then emerge and you can use these to inform and refine your choices. You can do the same for what specialty you want to do as well. For example, um, can you bear doing cell culture? If not, um, then you probably want to avoid cellular biology. And you also think need to think about what's achievable. Um, a four months, four months is quite a long time, but it's also quite a short time in terms of research. Um, particularly if you've got a day release program, you might struggle to do a lab project. Um, the next thing is to try not to take too much on board um, and don't be afraid to say no. Um, and this is something that I still struggle with. So it's really a skill that you should be trying to perfect um, as you go along. Um, and make sure you finish any project that you do start with them. Um, finally, have a backup plan. Um, what happens if you can't do your main project? So for example, um, one of my ideas would be to do some data anal an analysis on my, my AFP, but unfortunately we couldn't get access to the data in time, even though I'd organized it um, in my F1 block, um, we still couldn't get access to the data. So I had to have a backup plan for that. So I ended up doing a systematic review as well. Um, and I'd encourage you to think beyond your project. So four months is a long time. Um, you won't have to do any on calls and you'll have so much time to do things. You'll have time to go and see that weird operation or clinic you wanted to watch. Um, you can do teaching or be the chair of some society. Maybe have a side hustle or a hobby that you'd want to spend more time doing. I think the strength of the AFP is not necessarily the project you do, but the time you have to explore whatever you want. And you might end up doing a research project that's not particularly successful, but because you had the time to spend doing the things you enjoyed and the things you were interested outside of the project, you got much more out of your AFP. And with that in mind, I'd encourage you to be opportunistic. Know your ABCD, always be collecting data and think, can I get an output out of this? And not just publications, but say you're doing a teaching session. Um, think about the feedback you can get collecting that data um, might be something that you can put in your portfolio later. And while it's good to be ambitious, um, it can be difficult to achieve anything in four months. Um, it's unlikely that you'll get a nature paper out of this, 
although one of my friends did. I'm not salty at all about that. Um, and I found this study very interesting. Um, they asked 56 AFPs uh, what their outcomes were from their time during their AFP. 60% um, wrote up a study for publication. 70% published their uh, presented their results in a meeting. And if I'm honest, I think those percentages are quite low. Um, I think everyone should be able to present at a local meeting, even if you don't finish your project. Um, you can still present your preliminary data or give people an update on what you're doing. Um, I did all of these outcomes except three of the educational ones, um, which was sort of focusing around curriculum design. Um, and I think you can get a lot done. Um, and these are sort of an idea of what sorts of things you might have as an output. But as I said before, um, I don't think the main aim of the AFP should be outcomes. Um, I think it should be to figure out whether you like research or not. But if you do want outcomes, um, aim to get the most out of everything you do before you even start doing it. One of my friends would refer to the holy trinity of outcomes, a poster, an oral presentation and a publication. And if this is your aim for every project, while well, you might not get all three for everything you do, you'll end up with a lot of stuff on your CV. Um, you also don't need to just aim for the best journal and international presentations. These are very difficult, particularly at your stage. Instead, think about easier options like local presentations, non-PubMed indexed um, journals or student journals um, and conference abstracts too. These might seem pointless um, because they don't count towards FPAS, but they pad out your white space questions. Um, they stress, show a strong research ethic. And also some ST3 applications want second authorships, some want non-PubMed indexed um, publications. So although they might not seem um, the most useful at this point, they are in fact very useful um, longer term. And you can list anything on your CV, so why not? Um, with this in mind, I'd encourage you to pick the low hanging fruit. Often the projects that students and AFPs get um, during medical school or the AFP block aren't the most amazing because remember you're still learning how to do research. Um, and because of this, it can mean it's harder to publish or present some of these things. And unless you're publishing, um, trying to publish a case report on your grandma's pneumonia, um, you'll be able to publish almost anything if you try hard enough. This is one of my favorite articles. Um, it focuses on, um, uh, it's an educational article um, but you can apply the same strategies for your own research. It has a great table in it that shows you all the places that you can publish things. Um, but it's also, it's not all about publishing. It's all about, it's also about making your life easier for yourself. Um, so as well as uh, seeking out those easy publication types, like uh, for example, writing a full research paper is very difficult. Um, if you've not done much writing before, you can seek out case reports letters, editorials, reviews, collaborative authorships. These are much quicker to write. It takes months to write a research, mm -hmm. to take a research project um, from start to submit it. It took me one day to write a case report that I published. Um, and you'll never write that nature paper when it finally comes if you can't write something simple. But like I say, it's not all about publications. Um, you can make your life easier by finding a mentor and that's not just your academic senior supervisor, but someone who can actually teach you research skills, so a PhD or a postdoc. You can also collaborate with others on your research. For example, um, you could run an experiment for someone else. In return, they'd help you run some of your, your experiments. Um, or you could write up the introduction for someone's project, and in return, they could do the same, and then you're getting your name on multiple publications, essentially by doing the same amount of work. Um, one of my friends used um, an analogy to describe research outputs, which I thought was quite good. He described that you have a kicking game and a defensive game. Your kicking game, your major successes, the international oral presentations, major prizes, publications in high impact journals. But if you only focus on kicking, you're probably going to lose the game because that only forms a minor part of it. Instead, you also need to focus on slowly gaining ground consistently over time. These are your local presentations, your case reports, and some of the smaller outputs. If you have a good defensive game, you might only need one kick to win the match. 
Um, but it's not easy to know what to do, what prizes or grants are available, um, what positions you could apply for. And one way you can do that, or you can figure out what's available, is by looking at what other people are doing. People generally like to show off what they want, or show off their achievements, particularly on LinkedIn. Um, so if you search for AFP at whichever deanery, ACF at whatever other deanery, you can have a look at what they've done. And this will give you an idea of what you can do, both in terms of research projects, but also extracurriculars, prizes, societies you can apply for, and things like that. So let's have a look at an example. This is Sarah, who kindly agreed for me to share her bio with you. Let's have a look at what she's done. So in addition to her AFP and her ACF, she's also done an integrated bachelor's degree, a master's of public health, um, and she's involved in global surgery and international groups. She's done some teaching and has developed some educational resources. I love looking at what other people have done. Um, for example, with Sarah, I didn't realize that there was a WFNS, a World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. Um, and you can use this role modeling to see what opportunities there are for you. For example, maybe you're interested in dermatology. Perhaps you want to set up uh, a World Federation of Dermatology Societies. Um, I will caveat this point though. Um, when you're looking at people's bios, um, don't be too hard on yourself. Um, remember that um, you don't have to work all the time and that someone will probably always be better than you. Um, as depressing as that sounds, it will make it a lot easier um, when you're looking at these things because there are some very impressive people out there. Um, you'll never get something by not applying. Um, and what do you have to lose? Only time and a bruised ego. Um, but we can avoid the second by embracing failure as a learning experience. I've applied to so many things and been rejected. Papers, grants, positions, and the first few times it really hurts. But after that it becomes much easier. It still stings a bit, but it's never as bad as the first time. Um, when you do get rejected, always ask for feedback and reflect on it. You can learn so much each time, and it can help you identify gaps in your CV too. And most of these things, most of the time, these things don't really matter. Um, there are so many journals you can apply for, so many grants and so many prizes. Um, so you're bound to get a few if you apply to enough of them. And by learning from the things that don't matter, it increases your chances of getting the things that do matter. Um, and success breeds success. I'm pretty sure this is my dad's favourite phrase, um, and apparently it's been scientifically proven. Me being here right now is an example of that. Um, and in this study, they showed that you only need a small amount of success early on um, for it to generate a big difference. So by attending this talk today, um, by learning how you can do these things, hopefully um, an early case report, learning those skills might be all that's required to succeed. But it is a balance. Um, Avoiding the first problem um, that we described in that applying to a lot of things can waste time um, is difficult. Um, but it can be achieved by limiting the amount of time you spend applying to these things. Um, for example, when I was at medical school, I entered a lot of essay competitions. Um, why? Two reasons. My primary aim um, was to improve my writing style and my speed. Um, and obviously the added the secondary aim was to potentially win a, win a prize and that was an added benefit. Um, but as the likelihood of winning the prize is quite low, I'd limit the amount of time I spent on each of the essays I was writing. So I'd only spend one and a half days maximum on each essay. And that way, if I didn't win, it didn't really matter as I hadn't wasted a whole week writing something. The other thing you can think about is recycling your waste. Um, so if you make an application to something, save it. That way, the next time you apply, you can use it again, hopefully all of it, but definitely parts of it. Um, and for essays, if they're rejected, try and use it for something else. Maybe submit it to a student journal. Um, I didn't understand how important networking was when I started in academia um, and when I was at med school, medical school, but it is very important. Um, I'd recommend all the 
um, foundation year adopters to get Twitter. Um, it's a really useful resource. Um, it allows you to network with literally anyone. Um, you can send anyone a message. They may or may not reply. Um, more often than not, though, they do. And that means that you've got essentially access to the entire world's um, experts. You can ask anyone any question. Um, for medical students, maybe, maybe you want to consider joining Twitter, maybe not. Um, I think it can induce a little bit of anxiety. Um, I wasn't on Twitter as a medical student, and I'm quite glad I wasn't in a way, because um, I think I would have got anxious about it, because um, you can be overexposed to all these opportunities, um, and you can feel as though you need to work all the time. You don't. You can, you can relax. Uh, you need to work hard, um, but you, you don't need to work the entire time. Networking, though, allows you to find out the insider information that's not often published. So if you're not on Twitter, um, it would be worthwhile speaking to people about where you want to go. So, for example, speaking to the current AFPs, if you're finally a medical student, speaking to them can help you find out the insider information about uh, the AFP project, or AFP project or AFP um, in that deanery that you want to, to apply to. Um, if you're a current foundation trainee, I'd encourage you to do a taster week as well during your AFP block, simply because it can be very difficult to know um, what specialty you want to do. Even if you're sure, it can allow you to maybe um, see a really niche part of that specialty. For example, not many centers offer andrology, urology research. That's pretty niche. Um, so if you're interested in that, if, if you're interested in urology like me, maybe you'd want to do that. Um, and uh, there's this article, I'd really recommend it. I hear it's quite good. Um, and that, that, te that can sort of walk you through all the things you'd need to do to do a taste a week. Um, I'd also encourage you to do something fun. Um, spending your entire time at med school or foundation training, focusing solely on research, means your CV will probably be quite a boring read and you will be probably pretty bored. Um, and unless you've got an amazing project, um, it probably won't stand out. So have a think about what your unique selling point is. Maybe you run a sport uh, or maybe you do a sport or you run a society, something like that. Um, I'd aim to be as rounded as possible um, for your own sanity, uh, if nothing else. Um, so what are the downsides to doing an AFP? Well, research is difficult. It's frustrating um, when your experiment fails and you have to repeat it, especially if, if it's the fourth or fifth time it happens. It can take a huge amount of time to do research, not just the project, but the write-up, preparing posters, things like that. And most of the work is done outside of working hours, so you don't get paid. And it's time that you could be doing a locum too. You need to hit deadlines. So last week I stayed up until midnight one day um, because I needed to make changes to a paper um, so we could submit the results to a conference by the deadline. Um, and you'll need to make sacrifices. So I wrote this presentation um, on a night shift uh, last week when I could have been sleeping or I could have been watching a film or something like that. Um, and it's also lonely as well. Um, simply starting a new job in a new city on an academic block means you won't have as much exposure um, to everyone who's doing the normal foundation program. Um, and running experiments in the lab, sometimes they'll be running at weird hours. Often you'll just be doing the experiments alone. Um, so it can be a little bit lonely. Um, these two studies uh, by Bogad and um, Borelli um, looked at some of the other problems that students encountered. So there was a lack of structure. Um, like I say, you've really got to drive your own project most of the time. Someone won't really, they won't really be looking at what you're doing. Um, they won't be chasing you. You have to be driving it. Um, there's also variable experiences between trainees. So some will have a really good time. Some might have uh, and get loads of stuff out of it. Some might have a really difficult time. Um, and that, I think, is the benefit of speaking to people who've done it before. Um, they'll be able to give you that insider info about what worked, what didn't work, and why. Um, four months is quite a long time, but it's also quite a short time in terms of research. So if you think about someone doing a PhD, that's three years long. 
um, and they're going to get an output out of that. And even then, some people struggle um, to get outputs out of that. So four months is, isn't very long. But equally, it can be a very long time. You can get a lot of stuff out of it. Um, you also have to apply while you're at medical school and it might conflict with exams you have or maybe learning. Um, and your AFP comes out after your um, foundation offer. Uh, so it comes out before your foundation offer. Um, so it might be hard if you don't get your top choice AFP because you might be thinking, well, I've got an AFP in one city, but I don't really want to be there. Should I wait until I get my foundation offer um, and see if I get it in my top choice? Um, the other, On the other hand, um, if you get the right location, but you don't get your first choice AFP and you're in a place that has an inflexible AFP program, you might end up doing a project in a specialty you don't want to. Um, so that's difficult too. AFP blocks are also unbanded, so you make less money. In theory, um, you can do loads of locums, and um, uh, yeah, you can you can make you can actually make more money on your AFP um, by doing night shifts at the weekend or on calls at the weekend. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, oh, and um, it's also not always fun. Um, sometimes it's type one fun, but mostly it's type two fun. Uh, something that commonly comes up is, are you missing out on your clinical training? I would say, no, you are not. Um, in my opinion, foundation training largely misses the training part. Um, you only miss four months and most likely those four months will be a scribe, will, will be you being a scribe on medical ward rounds. Um, you won't struggle to fill your competencies. I did half of mine in a week. It's really not difficult. So if you have a modicum of organizational skills, you'll be absolutely fine. Um, Jill asked me to share some of my interesting AFP outputs. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the foundation program is a great time to explore other things you're interested in. Um, so although I did get a couple of, um, I did work on a couple of projects, um, to be honest, they weren't that interesting. I feel as though my interesting outputs were the things I did outside of my um, AFP block. Um, I started a society at university called We Are Donors um, and during my AFP we grew it into a charity. Um, so we give talks to, organ, talks to schools about organ donation and over the two years of my AFP block we built a community consisting of nine groups in the UK um, and we spoke to over 3,500 students. Um, and by exploring this interest, um, first of all, I enjoyed it a lot, but also we won loads of prizes um, from universities, uh, international and national conferences, and we were awarded grants for our work. And if anyone's interested in, um, maybe you, you don't have a leadership position, um, if anyone's interested in setting up uh, a group at their university, please send me an email. And how did I come up with this idea to turn my society into a charity? Well, I saw an AFP had set up a charity on their LinkedIn page when I was looking at that in final year. And I thought I could do that. Um, I also started a journal, again, by expanding on some of the work I'd done as a medical student. Um, I worked with the National Students Association of Medical Research to found a journal. And I was editor in chief of the first two issues. Um, and I'd encourage everyone to submit something to that and the links there if you need it. Um, so essentially the world is your oyster. You can do anything um, during your AFP. So thinking beyond the AFP, um, I won't spend too long on this as I know Will will be talking about this um, in more depth. However, it's worthwhile having a short term plan um, and a long-term plan. So what will I be doing in the next year or two? And what will I be doing in the next five years? So if you're an AFP currently, one way you can help yourself and help plan is by thinking about um, the ACF and ST3 criteria. Um, if you don't end up applying for an ACF, you'll still have ticked all of the boxes for the ST3 criteria by looking at it. So it's worthwhile. Um, and here are some resources. Um, I'll touch on these in a little bit, sorry. Um, so I didn't apply for the AFP, a ACF um, or core training in my F2. 
um, because I knew I wanted to do research, but as I said before, I wasn't really, really sure which to choose, um, whether transplant or urology. And with the ACF, you're locked into it. Um, so it's a 10 year program, the ACF. Um, so I took a year out um, as an anatomy demonstrator. I did a bit more urology and found that was a good fit, but I still wasn't really 100% sure. Um, so I applied for the Cambridge ACF in transplant and the Oxford ACF in urology. And in the end, I was fortunate enough to get both. So that scuppered my plan to make my decision a little easier. Um, but I think it shows that uh, if you do your academic preparation well, it doesn't matter so much um, if you change your mind about what specialty you want to do later. I think it does help knowing what you want to do early on um, because you can put all your eggs in one basket. But if you change your mind later, that can make it slightly more challenging, but it's not impossible. I did it and I know people who did ENT, um, all ENT, and then they change their mind and now they're a general surg surgical ACF. Um, so it doesn't matter if you change your mind. Um, but beyond AFP, um, I think you have to be genuinely interested in research. Um, and I don't think it's worthwhile applying if you're just doing it for your CV. It's far too much work. Um, and you really, you're taking away someone else's place and you won't get the most out of it. So I wouldn't recommend that. Um, and you don't need loads of publications. I think I had three when I applied for ACF, um, but you do need a unique selling point. Um, so I think it'd be worthwhile working on that. Um, so for further reading, for medical students, these are two articles I'd recommend. Um, they summarize the positives and negatives well um, and how to apply as well. Uh, they also publish the white space questions in advance now, which they didn't when I applied. We only had a week to write ours. And I think even if you're not um, in the position to apply, so you're in non-final year and you're watching this talk, I think it might be worthwhile having a look at those anyway, because um, it might help you see if there are any gaps in your CV that you might want to fill in the time you, you have left. Um, and for foundation doctors who are interested in applying to the ACF, um, they publish the interview shortlisting criteria. So it's worthwhile having a look at those in advance and you can see those in appendix five of that article or that, that, uh, that um, report. Um, so you just essentially you just need to try and work through that and tick every box on there. Um, some of them are quite difficult, so you might not get them. Um, I didn't have all of them and I still got my ACF. Um, but it's worthwhile having a look at those and then also the core and specialty training portfolio schemes as well to help you plan what you might want to do. Um, so in summary, we've talked about what the AFP can offer you, strategies for making the most of your AFP, um, and you can also apply these more generally to research at any time. Um, and we've also talked uh, briefly about uh, how to start making a plan for the future. Um, and how that can help you um, in your future too. Uh, so I want you to reflect on the following questions. Why do you want to do research and be specific about that? Um, what specialty project or supervisor might want you to might might you want to pursue? And again, be specific. Um, are there any missing outputs from what you're already doing? And can you squeeze the pips from anything you've done anymore? What's your unique selling point? What extracurricular activities are you doing? Um, and taking all of this into account, what's your plan for the next two years? I started getting inter interested in research um, in my fourth year of my medical degree. And um, I sort of seriously considered um, the AFP about 18 months before, before applying. And before then I didn't really have anything um, on my CV. So you can do quite a lot in that amount of time. And if you've left it until the last minute, again, I wouldn't worry. You can often um, piece together all the things you've done um, into something that tells quite a nice story anyway. So um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll be able to, I'm happy to answer any questions if you just post them in the chat. Um, and these are some opportunities you might be interested in. Um, as I discussed previously, we're looking to set up new university groups um, and you can send me an email um, on that email address. If you have some things um, that you want to, you think might be suitable to publish in a student journal, 
Um, I'm not involved in this anymore. I've passed the baton on to someone else, um, but I'd highly encourage you to do it. It's really good at getting um, uh, sort of honing your research skills and writing skills. And also if you, if you don't have any publications and maybe you want a collaborative authorship, um, you can get involved in this um, collaborative that we're running. Um, and you can find out more information about all of these um, on the links or by sending emails. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matt. Up next, we have not one, but two speakers who will talk about academic careers beyond AFP. First, we have a former AFP and a current ST7 in neurology, Dr. William Sedley. Welcome, Will. Well, thanks for the invitation to speak and for your attention. My name is Will Sedley. So I, I'm a neurology trainee, nearly finished training, and have uh, had the uh, privilege to be on the academic track, starting with the AFP uh, for some years now. Um, so I'm obviously, I can't tell you everything about careers that might lie beyond AFP, but often the most useful thing is really just to hear from the experience of someone who's kind of been there and taken some next steps. So hopefully, you'll uh, find these useful in some way. Um, so just a very brief summary of what we're going to cover. Um, I'd like to start with really a step back and actually why, we, why we're doing any of this and even considering doing AFPs. And then my experiences in terms of where I stood, uh, what my interests and experience were before the AFP, what I did on the AFP, um, the next steps I've taken and hope and with a little luck what the future may hold for me. So I, I think what it really boils down to is why are we doing this? It's, it's to be in the privileged position to be paid to indulge in what should eventually be our main hobby in life which is to conduct enjoyable uh, and innovative experiments meaning we enjoy the process and enjoy doing it and it's new it's never been tackled before and it serves an important purpose and I think if you can tick all those boxes then why would you want for anything anything else as a sort of main activity in life really so it, it's worth bearing that in mind because I think if there's too much deviation from it feeling like this for too long bearing in mind there'll always be moments that things don't feel so good then you've got to question things so before the AFP I think I've known for some time I was interested in the brain and I mean the workings of the brain and the mind. Um, in medical school I would read Oliver Sacks and Ramachandran. Um, I foolishly subscribed to the Journal of Consciousness Studies uh, which had some great articles. I rarely got around to even reading them. But they looked good on the shelf. Um, liked things like meditation and was interested in the idea of psychedelic uh, substances and how they could alter one's experience of reality with such a simple chemical effect. Uh, phenomena like phantom limb pain and how our experiences are so different to necessarily uh, what the physical world uh, is sometimes. And things like mirror therapy that can be uh, used to uh, attempt to treat these. And I really didn't know whether I wanted to be a neurologist or a neurosurgeon or um, specialise in non-invasive brain stimulation, even a psychiatrist or a radiologist, but something something neuro. And I, lots of ideas, very little concrete path. Um, in terms of actual sort of concrete experience to back this up and bolster the CV, not a lot really. I had my medical degree experience so far. I've done a research project in microbiology and nothing geared towards these interests. Um, I liked the idea of research. I don't think I really knew what it was all about. Saw the AFP advertised. I was studying in Nottingham and thought, hmm, that looks quite good. Why not apply? Um, so just to look at a bit of a map of the UK, I'd grown up in Cambridge and sort of thought about returning closer to home. Saw this, uh, saw this post in Newcastle, thought, hmm, well, it's, it's, kind, you know, it's kind of a step towards Cambridge. So I thought, could I live? Could I live in the north? I've never really been. Well, maybe I've been once. Seemed quite nice. Yes, I can. Applied and was lucky enough to lucky enough to get the post. Um, so that was great. And I, there were a lot of ideas and possibilities, and not really a clear sense of where to begin. Um, so I think the, the purpose of the AFP is that it's 
it's an initial step. It's a kind of foot in the door. You don't have to do an AFP, but it, it helps get you started finding a research area, a supervisor, just getting some experience of the research method and techniques under your belt and, and pilot data, the, the all important pilot data to furnish your future applications. So the academic neurologists um, at, at the time were uh, Professor Turnbull, or uh, Professor Sir Douglas Turnbull now, um, Professor David Byrne, Professor Patrick Chinnery, and Professor Tim Griffiths. So I spoke to all these individuals and they had very different research areas from mitochondria, movement disorders, genetics, and then uh, auditory brain functioning. And I think that the latter was geared most to my interest. So I approached uh, Tim Griffiths, who was kind enough to take me on really. So moving up to Newcastle, there were all these grand visions about all the sort of historic quayside, all the redevelopments and all these lovely views you see when you cross into Newcastle for the first time. And I think the reality was even better when I turned up in my hospital accommodation, as you, uh, as you see here. Um, so so when, I, when I first joined, I turned up in uh, Tim's lab and he was like, well, great, good to have you here. What should you actually do? And I think he went out on a, on a bit of a limb for me and it struck up this collaboration with Matthew Howard in Iowa, who's a neurosurgeon doing uh, invasive brain recordings in neurosurgical patients. Just struck up a very important collaboration. I thought, why not send Will there to kind of help cement this? And I think his exact words by email were, he is bright, motivated and largely socially appropriate. Now, where the largely came from, I really don't know. I thought it'd be on my best behavior, but he, he obviously saw through that to what I was really like anyway. And the response was, great, send them over. Uh, uh, they put me up here, which I think it certainly at the time, make, make of it what you will now. This was the lap of luxury. That was my hotel room for six weeks. Um, and, and we got some, nice, got some nice data and things. So it was not very clinically relevant, the research. So maybe not the best long-term prospects for a clinical academic. Uh, and Tim said after that project was done, well, what about working on tinnitus? Um, ringing in the ears, isn't it? I thought, so my initial thoughts were that sounds really quite dull. I'm interested in lots of sort of much more juicy phenomena, complex hallucinations and things like that. There's not really a local um, research expertise in tinnitus as one or two studies doesn't really overlap with clinical neurology. Uh, so naturally I said, great, yes, let's go for it. Um, and, and just, uh, I hadn't realized actually how common tinnitus is. And you'll see on this uh, simple pie chart here actually that for people to truly have no tinnitus at all puts you in the minority. And then there's this very large category in black who hear some ringing in their ears if they're in a soundproof room no other sound source and listening to what they can hear they do hear a very faint tinnitus and then there's this wedge sort of 15 percent of the population who have it persistently audible above background noise and then a slice about two percent of the population which is still a lot of people who have a very impaired quality of life so it's an important clinical problem and the other thing is it's you, you know you may think oh that this is the auditory pathway from ear to brain that's quite complicated when you really get down to it, actually, there's a lot more going on. You know, you've got the cellular level processes and synaptic level processes in the cochlea where the damage may occur. So you kind of need to understand things right down to that fine grained level. And you need to go to much broader brain networks that actually underlie perception itself and how one reacts to something. What makes the difference between someone who goes, oh, it's a little bit annoying, shrug, I'll get used to this, and someone who whose life is ruined by it. And I think if you really want to fully understand the condition like this, you're actually traveling the length and breadth of the brain. And I think I quite quickly came to realize that uh, and found the research area fascinating. And even just understanding the system and what it's doing in, in a simple ongoing low level per, uh, perception like tinnitus is challenging enough. So my work consisted of, well, uh, you probably won't generally recognize this, but this is the Hexham Saltburn train and I was uh, staying in uh, Middlesbrough at the time, commuting up to Newcastle. I spent a lot of time on this uh, two carriage train and it's very associated in my mind with tinnitus for a number of reasons. Firstly, it squeaks and squeals like anything because it's very old and it sounds like tinnitus. And secondly, I realized that in my long hours sat on this train, 
I could cause a little bit of tinnitus in myself by doing forced jaw contractions, clenching uh, or forward protrusion by activating the pterygoid muscles here. I do not recommend you do this because initially this would elicit a tinnitus-like sound at the time. What I came to find is I've done this so much over the weeks and months that the tinnitus became permanent and has never gone away since. So as I say, I really don't recommend it. Never bothered me, but ideally would probably not be there. Um, so I did a research study that I came up with using this jaw movement phenomenon um, to make people's tinnitus louder. And you can examine them in a state where it's louder, where they're making the jaw movements and where it's quieter. Contrast those, did some EEG recordings, and it all looked very promising at first, but eventually it turned out what we were seeing was just a product of the muscle activity and not underlying brain activity, which can be very hard to distinguish, and the controls just weren't pushing as hard. Um, so unfortunately, that study and everything I'd sort of invested in for the second half of AFP really didn't come to a lot. So by the end of the AFP, I was left thinking, well, I've got really good colleagues who I enjoy working with. Um, I found an enjoyable and important, interesting research area. I've sort of taken my own angle on it, but it hasn't worked. So where to go from here? And, you know, when you all invested in one project and things don't go well, it can get a bit dispiriting. Um, but I thought, no, I enjoy the process and things are bound to work in the end. I thought, well, I should keep at it. I'll try another approach and go and tell something, something works. So I applied for an academic clinical fellowship and was lucky enough to get that. And, and in the ACF, um, I took further attempts. I repeated the same study with a different recording modality. This is MEG or magnetoencephalography, which measures magnetic fields. It's much better at separating muscle activity from brain activity, but still the same problem was there. We couldn't be confident it solved it. And had another go using a different way of making tinnitus louder and quieter by using sounds to temporarily modify the tinnitus. And that, that worked very well. Um, it was, and it actually yielded some very interesting results, uh, which I didn't fully understand at the time. Um, but back at, at the time, the prevailing theory was you've got these high frequency brain waves called gamma oscillations in the auditory cortex. And really those are what generate the tinnitus and that perception. And if that's the case, then when tinnitus gets louder, they should go up. And when tinnitus gets quieter, they should go down. And what I found is when, sure enough, if tinnitus goes down, these go down as expected. But if, the, if you make the tinnitus louder, they also go down as in you can have a positive correlation here in red and yellow or a negative correlation, depending on the exact context. And that kind of, that really shattered the prevailing theory. Um, and the, the results were quite striking and hard to ignore and reproducible across many individuals. So that, that kind of extinguished um, a number of bonfires as my first published foray into the field. And I suppose I didn't make myself many friends at first, um, but we're all, we're all friends now. Um, so that was a good high note. I thought, you know, finally, this is something really important and useful in the field that I've come up with out of, you know, out of my own, you know, out of my own research direction and ideas, really. And I had a lot of things I was excited to do next and sort of, I thought, oh, well, for a PhD fellowship, I can do this and I can do some spectroscopy and I can do some MRI and I can do some MEG and some EEG. And so Tim Griffith said, okay, look, that's a shopping list of ideas you're going to struggle to get that funded, make it hypothesis driven. So while I was out walking the dog one day, it finally clicked and I put together a uh, plausible hypothesis that linked all the different strands and sort of packaged it and sold it um, and, and was fortunate enough to get funded. Um, and I carried out my shopping list of ideas and it didn't quite conform to the hypothesis, uh, which is kind of unsurprising because the hypothesis was retrofitted. So it should have been no shock to see that that wasn't, um, wasn't what turned out to be the case. Um, but I got some nice results of various forms. And then in the last two months before I had to submit, and on that note, if any, anyone who does a PhD as a clinician in future, remember this, remember this, and remember this. Write up and submit before you go back to clinical training. No ifs, no buts, even if you've not finished, even if you don't think you've got enough, because it is nigh on impossible and will make your life hell afterwards. And it's so easy to write up when you've got all your time dedicated to it. So I said, last two months, I'm gonna do conduct research. Last two months is write up time. And so I just sat there, read my results, read the literature, and I thought, well, how does this all fit together? 
And I had some sort of ideas, but I thought, you know what? Um, I knew what I needed. Now, I don't know if any of you have kids, but this is a popular children's book by the author of The Gruffalo called The Scarecrow's Wedding. And in what they, what they want to have, the whole theme of the book is they want to have the best wedding ever, the best wedding yet, the wedding that no one will ever forget. I had a young child and was uh, uh, read, reading this book a lot to them. I thought what I need is a figure. I need one figure that puts everything together, the best figure ever, the best figure yet, the figure that no one will ever forget. And so I started with some sketches that were very rough, just putting in everything I'd found and the other key bits from the literature that I believed and just thought, well, how, put them in one place, see if they make sense. And by about seven or eight iterations, I ended up with this. It's not quite the figure that no one will ever forget. It's the figure that no one will ever comprehend. Um, but it did the job. It crystallized the thoughts and suddenly everything made sense to me. And this culminated in what's been a very influential theory I've come up with to explain tinnitus and all the bits that never made sense before, um, which has kind of been a springboard into a prominent profile. And so I started out by making enemies and telling people they were all wrong. And then I've gone, actually, you can, everything does work and you're kind of all right and have made some friends since. Um, in a nutshell, um, tinnitus, the first bit of tinnitus is a little bit like these random black dots, but in the auditory system. I don't know, don't know if any of you've seen this picture, but generally at first you don't think it's anything but abstract or random dots, but eventually if you look hard enough at it, you see what it's about. Uh, and if you haven't seen it already, it's a Dalmatian dog and you see its head here, it's sniffing at something, there's a tree over there. And once you've seen it, once you've recognized a meaningful pattern, you can't unsee it. And tinnitus is basically like seeing a pattern in random brain cell firing in the auditory pathway. And once you've seen that pattern and given it a meaning, you can't unsee it or unlearn it. And then all you have to do is explain things like, well, the hearing loss and everything that predisposes you to it is just kind of cranking up the volume and making more of these dots more and more vivid, and it's easier to see the pattern. But the key second step is whether you see the pattern or not, and then it gets lodged, and then you're stuck with it. And the, the rest was just about actually laying down the brain basis for how this occurs. Um, so after, after my PhD, um, I applied for an academic clinical lecturer post, uh, which was quite handily available. It's another post that lets you do kind of 50-50 academic clinical training in blocks, or I actually did days of the week. It really depends on what your kind of research is. Uh, and I thought it was a nice position to generate some hypotheses from this model I created and, and test these. Um, I, I was lucky enough to get funding for a PhD student who's still working with me now. Um, and uh, I tried a number, a few tacks, and one of the one of the approaches does seem to have been successful in testing some of the predictions laid down by the model, uh, which may be a practical benefit in actually diagnosing or measuring tinnitus. And then at the same time, actually, it's amazing how when you're at an early stage in your career, you've you've just got all the time you want to focus on your research, get stuff done. You can be really efficient. That gets harder and harder because. You're asked to review papers, to sit on committees and bodies, to have discussions and collaboration with other researchers, give talks and things. And it's necessary and good and, and nice in a way, but it's, it's quite an upkeep and it's astonishing how much of your time you end up giving over to these things. And then again, you get a part of the, you know, each of these academic proposals to get you the pilot data, to get you onto your next step. And uh, by this point, the next step for me will be an intermediate fellowship like MRC or, or Wellcome Trust. Um, so, so I've applied for these, who knows what will happen, they're immensely competitive, um, but all, all being well, I would eventually obtain one of these posts. And then it's kind of about the ongoing challenges and match up a research interest in tinnitus with a clinical practice in neurology. There's a lot of overlapping conditions that probably have a very similar basis and mechanism that we do see in neurology. Um, which include pain, migraine, and even fibromyalgia that overlaps across a lot of specialties. So eventually, it'll be a little bit of sort of lateral expansion into these areas all, all going well. But we'll see. You have to take it slow and not overreach for fear of doing things badly. Um, so that's, that's about it. That's my experience in a nutshell. Um, thanks for your, uh, for your attention. I look forward to any questions or discussion we may hold uh, afterwards. Thanks. Thank you, Will. Next up is Dr. Malcolm Broadley. Malcolm is one of my colleagues and is director of the Northeast 
NHR integrated academic training pathway for doctors and dentists. Welcome, welcome. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation uh, to talk at the conference today. So my name is Malcolm Broadley. I work as a clinical academic in paediatric respiratory medicine in Newcastle. As you can see uh, by the backdrop, it's sometimes sunny in Newcastle, but not that often. And I'm really talking today because one of my roles is director of the Northeast NIHR Integrated Academic Training Programme. And the title of the, of the talk, which I hope will last about 20 minutes, is thinking about the next steps uh, beyond being an academic foundation programme doctor. So what I'm planning to cover is, first of all, probably asking you guys some questions as to why, why would you want to do academic medicine? Talk about some of the options, if that is what you want to do. Perhaps spend more time then specifically talking about the NIHR Integrated Academic Training Pathway and specifically what's most relevant to people at your stage is uh, the academic clinical fellow stage. So the next step would be to be an ACF. I thought it was important to talk a little bit about steps towards the end of being an ACF around doing a PhD and trying to get external fellowships to fund doing a PhD. And then finally, just briefly, I'll talk about the um, next steps after that even. So why bother with research or academic medicine is a really important question. Hopefully because you're tuning in to listen to this today on a Saturday, you're actually quite motivated around that question. And I think research or clinical academia or both mean different things to different people. You can probably all recognise uh, the, the, the different things mentioned here, everything from papers to presentations to quality improvement audits. But I think what probably drives and hopefully drives most of us is around improving clinical outcomes. Uh, so improving outcomes for patients. So why do research? This is a slightly older, older slide, and it isn't necessarily about uh, identifying new things. It can be about working out how not to treat people. And there's several good examples here. I was preparing this, I thought it really needs updated with the latest, and obviously hydroxychloroquine is a really good example of this around COVID-19. As mentioned, I'm a pediatrician. So here's just some more evidence for you from the paediatric world of the sort of impact that clinical research has had on outcomes for patients. So this graph here is showing the improvement in infant mortality relating to respiratory distress syndrome, basically with the introduction of surfactant. And you can see that that is a dramatic drop that happened with that intervention. And coming back to COVID-19, trying to make it a little bit more relevant to today, uh, clearly, uh, these results around dexamethasone from the recovery study uh, are, are perhaps some of the most widely published and publicised uh, clinical research results of our time, really, uh, but incredibly important uh, at, the, in, at this moment in time. If you think a little bit more broadly as well, uh, there's really quite a substantial body of evidence now showing that Hospitals that have a, an active research culture, departments that enrol patients into studies, uh, actually have improved outcomes. And you can show that not only for uh, patients who've actually specifically taken part in studies, but simply by being treated in a centre and not necessarily being part of a study yourself, those outcome, improved outcomes are transferred even to those patients. And this is just one quite well-known example in colorectal cancer. So if we start to think a little bit more personally about, about why, why you, and the way I look at it is that most importantly, you can only do research if you're inspired by it, if you're interested in it, if you think the questions that you're trying to answer are important. Because inevitably, it's going to involve a huge amount of hard work, as you've probably found already during your academic foundation posts. And it may be 90% uh, 
perspiration and 10, 10% inspiration, but you've, you've got to enjoy what you're doing. Uh, otherwise, you're just not going to find the energy um, to put in those hours, to put in that hard work. So this is a purposefully uh, out of date slide. And this is just perhaps the idealistic uh, pathway that people who were going to become clinical academics were, might, were meant to take. You can see how out of date it is because uh, we obviously no longer have SHOs or, or SPRs. But this was in theory the pathway that you were meant to take. The reality was often very different. And rather than that nice steady staircase of uh, career progression, it often felt more like a, a sheer rock face that you were trying to climb. And it is true uh, that there are plenty of different routes that can be taken to reach the same point. Just important that everyone remembers that. What is a really positive thing, undoubtedly, is the NHR integrated pathway though. So as I mentioned that those previous slides were purposefully out of date and now there is a much more clear uh, uh, and resourced clinical academic training pathway. And I would guess that being a motivated audience you're probably all fairly well aware of this so I'm just going to quickly run over it over the, ne the next couple of slides. This is a medical audience uh, but obviously the NHR is not just about medics, so it's about a multidisciplinary approach to try and uh, increase a culture of clinical research uh, in the country. And here you can see a uh, particular mention of the fellowships uh, and pathway relevant to doctors and dentists. This is it in a bit more detail. You're obviously all at this stage, the Academic Foundation Programme with the obvious next step in that pathway being academic clinical fellowships or, or ACFs. So I've taken a few slides, just these are generic NIHR slides, but they're, they're, they're quite important and summarise the background probably far better than I could in my own slides. So each year NIHR fund about 250 ACF posts um, and also 100 clinical lecturer posts, which I'll briefly mention at the end. Importantly, from your point of view, they are administered and appointed to on a regional basis uh, via a grouping of medical schools, um, so-called deaneries or higher education groupings, uh, medical education groupings, and also linked NHS trusts as well. The so-called IAT partnerships. The actual posts themselves, um, I wouldn't worry too much about this, but the way that they are allocated uh, on a national basis to each region can either be via a formula or a competition system. So effectively, there's a bidding process that goes on. So not every region uh, may not have exactly the same number of posts or even the same specialty of posts available. Uh, and this is partly worked out by a competitive bidding process and then there are other metrics involved like NIHR funding that each region may have attracted etc. As mentioned on the final bullet point there, there are also key uh, priority research themes and some posts can be linked to a theme. And these are the current uh, priority areas as identified by NIHR. And I guess the, the idea behind this is to try and encourage young academics to to move into these particular areas of need and these will obviously change with time so i think you're all probably listening to this to hear about acf posts so the short summary is that they last for three years they give an academic split of 25 percent. so that means that 75 percent of the time is spent doing clinical training but a quarter of the time is spent um, in academic based work and this can vary in different regions and there's a probably less flexibility than there is around clinical lecturer posts but there can be some flexibility exactly what's done and how it's done importantly they're obviously specialty specific in terms of the clinical specialty and they're applied to and allocated on that basis and the usual or expected outcome 
is to at the end of an ACF uh, then attract funding for an, uh, ideally from an external fellowship to then undertake a PhD or MD. So quite a lot of the time during an ACF post may be about trying to improve your CV to make yourself competitive for these sort of applications to generate pilot data for these fellowship applications and hopefully also uh, generate publications but all working up towards this target really. It is possible uh, to apply for an ACF post if you happen to have already done a PhD and I can think of several people in in my region uh, that have done that and obviously as mentioned about the different paths um, you don't absolutely have to go on to do a PhD and um, I think I'm correct in saying that a run through clinical training post still follows with with, a, with a, an individual if they if they choose to do that rather than undertake a PhD. Really importantly, uh, they're normally advertised in October each year. There was quite a bit of uncertainty this year around COVID and what was going to happen. But my understanding is they will, will be advertised potentially next week on the 1st of October. Um, nationally. So if you're interested in a, at that stage, you need to be looking out for adverts in the next couple of weeks. This is just to show you that NIHR have a lot of information on their website. Uh, this page gives you details of the programme leads uh, for each region. So th this is me here. And that also reminds me to say the next couple of slides uh, are taken from my colleague uh, John Sayer, and they talk a little bit specifically about the, the ACF programme in the Northeast, but are relevant to most other programmes as well. So just by way of illustration of the sort of broad range of specialty posts that are available, all of these have been available recent, in recent years uh, in the Northeast, and it's similar in most regions. You can see mention of themes here as well. And in all regions, there's some form of uh, teaching uh, attached to being an ACF as well. So, for example, in the Northeast, there's a, a program that leads to the award of a postgraduate certificate in clinical research. And this is regarded as a, a, um, something that has to be done. Um, and it teaches generic skills about research, governance and ethics, study design and data interpretation communication and education in research and this is done via a, a day release system and some online learning as well. What does research time give you? What does an ACF post give? So crucially it's, it's time to think, time to read, time to write away from a clinical area, away from having your bleep or deck phone going to try and develop those ideas as I mentioned. It can give you time to visit local research groups, even external research groups. Each post com comes with a bursary that can be used for travel, travel to conferences, but it could just be collaborative visits. Um, and it lets you obtain pilot data and build up your CV. And I think crucial to these posts are the academic supervisors as well. Um, clearly this is someone who's separate from your clinical supervisor but really important that you have uh, an appropriate supervisor or group of supervisors to provide that mentorship that guidance and to help you at this stage of training and I think it's having someone that you can work with is, is obviously crucial uh, and part of their job is to develop with each trainee an academic training program a realistic set of goals and targets so I've put in a few slides next from other talks that I've done about external PhD fellowships, because as mentioned, that's really one of the key sort of targets at the end of an ACF and what you should be working towards. They also crop up again later on in the so-called intermediate fellowships, but we're going to talk about PhD fellowships today. So a number of funding bodies uh, offer these sort of fellowships. Some of these websites are a little bit out of date, as you can see. But there obviously are uh, MRC. Welcome, uh, this is NIHR, who have, um, have their own fellowships and I have a slide coming up on that. And Welcome as well. Welcome have changed their model and often these are now uh, administered on a regional basis. And importantly, 
fair few charities and disease uh, offer disease specific fellowships as well. There's a lot of advantages to having an external clinical fellowship to fund a PhD. Uh, the amount of money offered tends to be enough to, to fund the work correctly. They're seen as prestigious things to have. Can bring allied opportunities, other training opportunities, uh, networking opportunities, etc. And it, as a trainee, it, it arguably gives you a certain amount of independence because it's 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 your fellowship. There are some downsides uh, in that these awards can be competitive. Uh, so putting in that hard work to develop an application uh, is is just absolutely required. And, uh, and you could argue they're dependent on track record and CV, as we've talked about. They may often involve an interview and can be a lengthy process. Some work's been done showing, I think these are these were holders of an MRC uh, training fellowship, and it, work's been done to show by having one of these, most people actually go on to an academic career and or hold senior clinical positions. So the outcomes are actually fantastic for people who have training fellowships. I mentioned that NHR have fellowships as well. And this slide is only in here to, just to point out to you that some aspects of their scheme have changed recently, but certainly there are, there are doctoral fellowships available in full details on the website. So to develop a fellowship application, I think you need all of these aspects. You clearly need the inspiration, you need that idea. It's helpful if that idea plays into a narrative around the disease that you're interested in. It can be a story about you and your career as well, because after all, this is about training. It's helpful to have supportive preliminary data and support in the broadest sense in terms of supervisors, institutional support as well. I think it takes time to prepare these things. There are different aspects of the application process and different audiences at, a different, at the different stages that you need to win over. So first of all, you've got to be eligible to be able to apply. Applications tend to be reviewed then by external peer reviewers. So these will logically be experts in that particular area. So they need to be impressed by the project and think that it makes sense and is deliverable. And then often there's actually an interview stage as well uh, for, for people that are shortlisted. And that is a much more general panel of experts. So you've got to be able to sell the project to that kind of audience and be able to answer their questions. The mantra being that uh, the person, project and place are all being assessed. In the next few slides, I'll just talk briefly about each of those aspects. So as mentioned, the project is obviously very important and that first stage of review, I think, is often about the project. Traditionally, these sort of applications will be hypothesis-driven projects that have to be both novel but deliverable as well for a PhD. Helpful if, we met, uh, if you have preliminary data and it's certainly crucial to have a logical experimental plan that isn't all predicated on just one experiment. The person, because this is obviously something that you need to be thinking about now. So I'm sure you're all enthusiastic people because you're choosing to listen to this. Um, but working on that CV in terms of publications, presentations, relative uh, relevant experience, all really important. Having supportive references that, that clearly show that those people know you as an individual, I think, can only help as well and try and articulate where that fellowship will take you. You need a supportive and appropriate team uh, that have that track record, that have the time though to be able to put the time into you as well. And clearly the, the, the wider environment and training environment are very important as well. So what happens uh, after you've successfully completed your PhD? So obviously now at this stage, and the next obvious step is a clinical lecturer post. So these posts, in brief, last for four years, often through to CCT. And they truly give a 50-50 split between academic work and clinical training, leading up to commonly for applications for intermediate fellowships. And CL posts give genuine flexibility about how that, how that time is spent. So just to summarise, hopefully, what I've gone through. 
perhaps really and most importantly choose to do what you enjoy inevitably it's going to be hard work and you have to pers persevere with it i would strongly recommend a career as a clinical academic though because i think that the, the pros outweigh the the cons so the advantages being that independence that it can be enjoyable stimulating and flexible and obviously it's hard work and there is a balance there with clinical work with family life for example but it's possible to achieve that balance i should acknowledge as i mentioned john sayer and nhr for some of those slides i think there's a chance to ask questions as part of the panel um, also would be happy uh, for anyone to contact me especially if you may be interested in applying for acf posts in the northeast thank you for listening many thanks to you both now we have our panel discussion if you'd like to ask our panelists anything please drop your questions into the hashtag afp uh, in our virtual uh, coffee room channel